Good and gracious God, we come before you today to worship you, to lift up our prayers and our burdens and release them, to feel the freedom of your spirit among us, and to go forth and build bridges and be a neighbor to others. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you this morning to please join me with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one who fashions us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Trust in God's promise of forgiveness. Let us confess our sin against God and one another. Take a moment of silence. Source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough. We hear your word. God hears our cry and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional. And we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Take a moment to share peace with one another. God's peace.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live, turn back, Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord.
The Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, It will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward. morning. How are you guys? You up? Wide awake? Still sleepy? Yeah, sleepy. You're sleepy? Yeah. Yeah, well I have a story this morning, so I'm going to tell you a story. It's about this. There was an old farmer, and he had two sons, and he got to a point where he's like, I'm too old to farm this farm, so he split the farm in two, and he gave half of it to his one son and half to the other. And the two sons got along like best friends in the beginning. Like they worked together and they loved having their side-by-side farms. And then one day, I don't know, an argument started between the two of them. And and eventually they stopped talking to each other. And for many years, they never even spoke a word between them. Even though the farms were like right next to each other. And talked to each other. One day, one of the brothers was at home, and a carpenter came to his house, and he said, I need some work. Is there anything I could do? And the brother said, yeah, I got a job for you. Build me a fence down on the line there between me and my brother's farm, right on the river, right next to the creek, and build me a fence that's so high, I don't ever want to see him. And so he says, I'm, I'm going to go into town today, and I'll be back tonight. So the farmer left, and the carpenter went down to the creek to build his fence. But when the farmer came back, he didn't find a fence. You know what he found? A bridge. The carpenter had built a bridge over the creek. And now the farmer went down, and he's like, what are you doing? But as he's saying that, his brother is walking across the bridge to meet him. Yeah. And you know what his brother, his brother says, for all the terrible things I did to you, I'm just, I'm so amazed that, that you would build a bridge and welcome me back. And he gives his brother a big hug and they reunite again. 
And so the farmer goes back to his farmhouse and he talks to the carpenter. He says, don't leave. Stay. I, I have some more work for you to do. But the carpenter says, I'm sorry. I can't stay. I have to go. For I have many more bridges to build. And you know, Sometimes we can get in fights with people and argue with them. We don't want to talk to them or see them or anything, right? And that's not what Jesus wants for us. Jesus wants for us to make peace with our neighbors and build a bridge of love between us and uh, to make that effort. So let's pray, and you can just follow along. Dear God, We know your desire for us is to live together in peace and harmony. Help us to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love a good story. I love history, especially stories from history. I love the lessons that our heritage can teach us and and sharing those stories, whether you're at a family reunion or some sort of gathering or reading it from a book or watching a documentary. I just, I enjoy hearing the stories of our past and our heritage. And it always surprises me. I I marvel at how cyclical life is. It just seems like things repeat themselves over the generations. And I'm also always perplexed as to how little we learn from our past. And so many lessons, and we don't learn them again and again. Now, in the study of history, you'll find that there are these defining moments And those are the ones where you remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, the smell of the air even, when it happened. It could be something personal, something like the birth of a child, or the death of a parent, or something more culturally significant, like the Great Depression, or the many events and and uh, uh, turning things of the 1960s or the space shuttle explosion. Now, some dates, they simply live in infamy. December 7, 1941. September 11, 2001. These dates are marked by terror. Attacks that came out of nowhere on ordinary days and took the lives of many people and left us, whoever that is that experienced this, bent over and breathless. Kind of like we got sucker punched. Tomorrow is the anniversary of September 11, 2001 when 19 al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four commercial airliners in a coordinator suicide attack. One plane slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Then a second plane slammed into the South Tower. A third one plowed into the Pentagon. And a fourth plane was targeted for the U.S. Capitol crashed into a rural Pennsylvania field after passengers wrestled control of the plane from the hijackers. 2,974 people died that day, including 343 firefighters and 60 police officers. 
And there are some people who are still missing to this day, over, over 200, I believe. Our country will never forget that day. It dramatically changed our concept of security, our confidence. And we see it affecting us even to this day, 16 years later. For when we experience insecurity, problems with confidence, whether as individuals or as communities, we are challenged to move forward and take risks because we want so much to have reassurance. And sometimes the way that we respond to this sense of uncertainty is to numb out. And a major way that we numb out is through addictive behavior. Before the 1930s, most disease and death were the result of infectious diseases, primarily smallpox and polio. Since then, diseases and death have increasingly been due to human behavior. We are more overweight, more addicted, and just plain more medicated than we've ever been in our history. When Paul writes his letter to the Romans, he refers to them to wake from their sleep. And I would think if Paul was writing that letter to us now, he would say that we are people who've fallen asleep. How do you check out? when life gets too loud or too stressful or just too much. Paul writes to the Romans that they are to obey the laws of how to relate with others, to wake up and follow the law, most importantly, love your fellow human being as yourself. And that loving your neighbor does not mean causing harm to your neighbor which is fine when you're talking about someone who looks like you, acts like you, sounds like you, has history similar to you. It's not as much of an effort to love them. But how do we love those who bring us terror? How can I love the ones who hurt me, who don't like me, who will never like me? or love me back. Who really is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor is a question that I really started examining in 2010 when I became involved um, in a six-week study uh, that I've actually shared just about every church that I've been a part of since then. Um, it's called Becoming a Good Samaritan. It's published by Zondervan Publishing. It's just a, a small group study, six weeks, looking at the story we so often call the Good Samaritan story. When you're in that study, what you consider is, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Who is my neighbor is the number one question throughout that time. And one of the things that I learned from Jesus' story is that loving others as yourself is to seek profit, good, and well-being of others as you would want for yourself. It means caring for the sick and the addicted and the outcasts whom you feel uncomfortable around. It means seeking justice and reconciliation even when it is unpopular and even when it is risky. It means honoring the poor. Think of that honoring the poor, 
recognizing and reconciling your own prejudice and fear of poverty. It means tending to God's creation, caring for the environment as though it were your very own body. And it means loving the forsaken, loving those who you could never forgive. That study from many of the groups that I've, I've shared it with or, or been a part of, and, and it's spread all ages. I've done it from junior high to, to senior citizens. And it became a signature moment in our spiritual lives, both as individuals and community. Each of us was affected differently and not in the same way, and you never could tell what the result would be. Some people didn't want to deal with it, and others were transformed And one of the things that common happened was a sense of mission and energy that we put into how we treated each other and the social ministries that we chose to support became invigorated with a sense of purpose that we didn't even realize we had lacked. You see, the neighbor defined by Jesus and his cross is anyone who crosses your path whether you like it or not, whether you like them or not. The neighbor we are called to love may be someone we don't associate with. It may even be someone that we try to avoid. The neighbor is always an unexpected appearance in the midst, just as Jesus is an unexpected appearance in our midst very often in our lives. I've learned that we don't love because people deserve our love. We love because God loves us when we didn't deserve God's love. And now we're called to put on Christ. That's what uh, Paul continues to say in his letter. Put on Christ. Clothe yourselves. Wake up from your lulling numbness and get dressed. Time to go. And putting on Christ means to become Christ. It's an internal transformation. It's what you wear on the inside. And we can practice this call to love our neighbor in worship. In fact, we do. Every single week, we practice this spiritual practice. That's what it's called, spiritual practice of loving your neighbor. The, uh, it is snuck into our service, and you didn't even know that. It's called sharing the peace. Do you know why that is part of our worship service? Why it is there? It has a purpose, and it's a greater purpose than checking out who's here and saying hi and checking in with your friends and, and greeting each other. It's not a welcome hospitality uh, extra that we threw in. It has a purpose in our what we call the work of the people, the liturgy. When we say, peace of Christ be with you, we're blessing each other. We're sharing a blessing with one another. It's a prayer on the other's behalf that you are extending. Passing the peace also reunites us with each other. So if there has been a difference throughout the week, if there has been a conflict with someone and you feel anger toward them, that is an opportunity to make peace. To bless them and pray for them. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says that if you are angry with someone, make things right between you before you take your gift to the altar. Our gifts to God and our relationship with each other are interconnected. It's all a part of stewardship. Can you believe that? Sharing of the peace is this action of stewardship. That's why we always share the peace 
before we present our gifts to the altar, somewhere in the service, so that it is before we present our gifts. The passing of a peace is our opportunity to make peace. So, try not to numb out or fall asleep. Keep awake. Feel the feelings that come up, the neighbors that you find difficult to love, and consider one step that you can take to make peace. And wear Christ. What we wear on the inside matters. To illustrate this, I, I have a story from one of my favorite preachers and, and pastors. His name is Reverend Norman Vincent Peale. He was kind of the parent of the positivity movement in which um, ministers and pastors began to uh, realize that the scripture was there to inspire us and not bang us over the head. Vincent Peale said, was walking into a tattoo shop one day. And he started looking at all the tattoos that were there. And he was appalled to read a tattoo that said, Born to Lose. And he asked the tattoo artist if anyone would wear that. Does anyone wear that? Does anyone get that tattoo? And the artist said, well, yes. And Peel was just outraged. How could anyone want to bear a tattoo that said, born to lose? And the tattoo artist said, before it was on body, it was in mind. What mind tattoo do you wear? What limits and fears threaten and terrorize your confidence and security, hold you back, numb you out from extending beyond what you see or believe are your limitations? How would you look in a tattoo that said, born to love? Because that is the tattoo of your mind that you were given. You were given that in your baptism, born to new life, born to a life of love, and that love is risky, and it's teeth gritting sometimes. But nonetheless, you are born to love. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Even in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. We pray for the church universal, reconcile our differences, forgive our divisions, unite us at your table. Hear us, O God. For your creation, increase our stewardship of all that you have given to us. Let the earth flourish for those who come after us. Hear us, O God. For peace in the world, end conflicts among nations, help leaders and citizens truly to listen to one another and to act for the good of all. Teach us by your example. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is For all those in need, bind up our hurts, heal divisions in our families, friendships, and neighborhoods. Comfort those who need your special care, especially Matt Henry, Chris Snyder, Kathy Kutzer, and Dana Kay. Hear us, O God. For this congregation, make us signs of your love and forgiveness in this community and in the world. Help us to grow in our love for one another. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In thanksgiving for all the faithful witnesses who put on, who put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we re remember especially Verdine Miller, keep us faithful until the day we rejoice in majesty with them. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. O oh God, we lift up all those who are facing the storms of Hurricane Irma. We pray for the people of Cuba, the, lion, the islands along the way, as it heads towards Florida. We pray for all the safety workers, the many people who are both have left their homes and those that stay. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting the power of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. You may be seated, and we'll have a sharing of gifts now.
God of life, you give us these gifts of the earth, these resources of our life and our labor. Take them, offered in great thanksgiving, and use them to set a table that will heal the whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and light. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will, loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. And the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So remembering his death and resurrection, we await for the day when Jesus shall return to free all of earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of Freedom. And join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. 
we do have the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now you may be seated. All are welcome to this table and to receive this meal of forgiveness as you believe you are receiving. We will commune by intinction today, so the ushers will uh, invite you to come forward. You may kneel or stand along the railing. You'll receive a wafer, which you may dip. So don't eat the wafer this time, you hang on to the wafer, and then you dip it in either the red liquid, which is wine, or the white liquid, which is grape juice, and there are gluten-free elements available. Let the ushers know if you need to be served at your seat. Come, let us eat.
I invite you to please stand and receive the blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Holy and compassionate God, in bread and wine you give us gifts that form us to be humble and courageous. May your words come to life in our serving and in our witness, that we may speak a living voice of healing and justice to all the world, through Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. may be seated. Just a time of announcements. Um, turn your attention to the messenger. Next week we'll be taking pictures for photo directory. You can check out those times on Saturday and Sunday and uh, you can come for that. You have an announcement? Uh, I just want to remind you about God's Help Our Hands. Uh, this is a neighborhood cleanup. Please read about it in your bulletin. I do want to say that we do have some containers for shredding, so we won't have a need for people to rip pieces of paper into little tiny pieces of paper, okay? We have a way of fixing that. But it says also will be secured containers for shredding if you want to bring your spreadable materials. I'm not sure what that is, but I, I think that would be the stuff that would be shreddable rather than spreadable, just so you know. I've got a couple of phone books. Will you shred them for me? There is a sign-up sheet for our camp out that we're having October, I believe, 13th. And there's a PowerPoint that Drew put together on the TV screen back there with a lot of pictures to see how much fun we had last year. So take a look at it and sign up. Thanks. I just wanted to remind all you ladies, um, Saturday morning. Saturday is a busy day, but at 11 o'clock we're going to have a women's luncheon, and this is a very exciting time for all of us women. Uh, we had, I think, eight or nine of the gals from here go to the triennial convention uh, that the women host every three years, and um, those gals that attended are going to be sharing their experiences, and something that makes me very excited to go is I want to hear all about what Bishop Eaton um, shared with them and how personable she was and everything. So um, if you've got a little salad, you can bring it and uh, come at 11. We'd love to hear, have you there and, and um, come and hear what they all experienced and enjoyed. So. All right. Thank you. Please receive the benediction. Now may the power of God strengthen you, the love of Jesus Christ heal you, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you, now and forever. Amen.
guided by the gospel, we... Go in peace. Serve the Lord.